I'm going to have to ask you uh, to forgive me for something. Um, last week, I, I mentioned something in the message that was wrong. And when I went back and listened to it, realized it. I just want to clarify. In the book of Romans, uh, when the Bible talks about that when God justified us, what I said was He sanctified us, and who He sanctified, He glorified. Well, that word's not in the sanctified. Now, He does sanctify us, that's true. But the passage says that when those that He called, He justified, and those that He justified, He glorified. Now, the point was that if He justifies you, He's already glorified you, you're going to glory. You're going to heaven. You're going to get a glorified body. All that's going to be true. All right? But I didn't say it exactly right, and I, just, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, but the, the, the point is that what God does, He does right. And we want to represent Him well. Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 13, and we'll pick up where we were, where we were last week. We'll read this, uh, the text again, and then go on from there. Uh, I was doing some studying uh, today and was looking at some things, something that I hadn't looked at in a long time. And uh, it actually fits with this particular study very well. And I'll probably pick up maybe one or two points out of that. But there are five warnings in the book of Hebrews. And uh, one of them is, is directly uh, uh, a part of what we're going to be looking at. And we'll probably look at that maybe next time. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Mark chapter 13, the Bible says this, Take ye heed, in verse 33, Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Now, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now, just a real quick summary of last week. We, we looked at this passage, and it talks about the fact that there's a crisis. There's a command. And the command is for us to watch. The crisis simply is, we're not doing that as we should. Uh, we're, we're, we're approaching too many things uh, in a casual way. And because of that, and maybe I'll, I'll give you a little brief understanding of the thing in Hebrews, is this. When we don't do what we should do, we let things slip. And when things slip, they don't slip ahead, they slip backwards. Uh, and as a result of that, you know in the day in which we live that it's not like it was. Uh, does the church have the influence in the world that it once had? No. Uh, uh, do we have the respect that maybe we once had? Well, no. Now, you say, well, I can't make somebody respect me. But yeah, but you can act respectful. Right. Right. Uh, no, you can't make somebody else do something, but you can do for yourself, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, we should not be backing up. We should be going forward. Right. And there's too much backing up that's taking place. I mean, when, when you see things that, again, like we mentioned last week, that are, that are under the name of Christ and, and claim to be Christian, but they don't look like anything that the Bible has to say, and that seems to be okay, uh, maybe there's some things that, that we look at and say, well, that's not so bad, but I've often wondered, when does it become bad enough? Yeah, right. Right, right. I mean, how bad does something have to be to be bad? How much sin does it take to be sinful? When we look at where all this started, what did Adam do? Something horrible? He disobeyed God. And maybe we look at that and say, well, that's no big deal. Plunge the whole world into sin. Must be a pretty big deal. So as we look at this, we've become casual in our approach to as the pastor preached just recently, about the holiness of God and the holy Bible that we have, the holy standards that God has established. And as a result of that, we are in a day of slippage. And it shouldn't be that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, the Bible talks about that there's going to be an apostasy in the last days. One of my favorite sayings that I've used many years, it doesn't have to be you and me. We don't have to be the ones backing up. 
uh, I've, I've found this to be the case that if we'll stand as we should, I believe we stick out. In a day when backing up, it seems to be the norm, we'll stick out. And we need to stick out. We need to be that light on the hill like the Bible talks about. So, all right, before we look at some of the biblical examples that teach us our need to watch, I want to uh, give us a point of interest to consider. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12, please. Uh, Romans chapter 12. And this chapter, by the way, is just a tremendous chapter uh, that speaks of being a living sacrifice. Yes, sir. It speaks of uh, our reasonable service. Yes. It's interesting how that word is really defined in the context. Reasonable service means complete submission to God. We would like to define it as being casual. But that's not the definition here. It speaks uh, of what our opinion should be in Romans chapter 12 about our, ourselves and the part that we have in the body of Christ and the responsibility that we have as being that part, what we should be doing. Uh, you know, what, what, what is it that God wants you to do? God has a plan for you. Right. And what is it? And when you find out what that is, to just make it pretty simple, you get at it. You, you do it according as God has, has given you the ability to do that. Our, our local assembly uh, in this passage is fitly framed together by God where the parts fit in a cohesive meshing that makes up the whole. Uh, when Christ for the uh, Caribbean was first talked about, and when I talked to Brother Sam and then I talked to the pastor... Uh, first time I'd ever met him. Uh, in Virginia, we, he was preaching revival, I believe, for Brother Walker. Is that right? And uh, we, I went up to the, uh, the motel and we talked. And uh, when, we were, I, when we were talking about that, I told him, I said, it looks like God's leading me in that direction, but what I want to be is a cog in the wheel. I just want to be, I want to do the part of what God wants me to do and what he wants me to be. And if I do that, and as God starts to put all this together, all the cogs will start to fit, and then we've got this thing that's working the way God would have it to work. But I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in being somebody else's cog. Right. That's not what God called me to be, and it's not what God calls you to be. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I guess this is pretty obvious. I know I, I'm a little different about the way I approach things, but I have never been saved 42 years, been preaching 40 years. I've never tried to preach like somebody else. That just never appealed to me. I, I didn't understand. Although, I've heard some great preachers in my time. I mean, just, and you look at them and say, I just marvel, you know, at, at what they do. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I preached down at the camp meeting in, in North Carolina. I believe it was the year before that that I preached in the camp meeting. And I told them, uh, there was two preachers there. Uh, one of them was Tom Gillum, and one of them was Brother Cashwell, who pastors the church. And I made the statement at the beginning of my message. I said, you know, I sure wished I could preach like Tom Gillum. And God told me why. He asked me why. I already have Tom Gillum. And, and Brother Cashwell was sitting on the front. Everybody calls him Brother Billy. And I said, I sure would like to be able to illustrate things and, and like Brother Billy, you know. And God said, why? I already have Brother Billy. He said, I called you. And I want you to be what I want you to be. And I want you to do this the way I want you to do it. That's, that's your cog. Yeah. Yeah. Be your cog. Yeah. But if you, if you approach your cog in a casual way, things aren't meshing right. right. Things don't fit together right. So, in uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, I want to look at verse 10 through 13. If you will notice in, in your Bible, that's just one sentence. There's a lot of sentences in the Bible that are long. But a sentence gives you a completed thought. And so let's start looking at verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. All right, verse 10 is treating the members of the body with respect. 
realizing that God has joined us together and expects us to work together in such a way that we realize we need each other. God didn't call us to just be this lone wolf thing. He wants us to work together. Now, uh, we're going to skip over verse 11 because that's the one I really want to zero in on. Look at verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. We need to rejoice in the truth that God is going to win. By the way, He's already won. Isn't that good? Let's just go ahead and rejoice now. We don't have to wait till this is over with. We're, we're going to win. And we have won. Christ has already done that. So He says, rejoicing in hope. All right? Then, uh, for, um, I'm sorry, patient in tribulation. Uh, we need to be patient because He does bring us through our difficulties. My favorite passage of Scripture. Jesus told His disciples to get in the ship, go to the other side. So you know where they were going? To the other side. He also knew there was going to be a storm before they got there. All right? 42 years ago, called upon the Lord. He saved me. I'm going to the other side. There's been some storms in the last 42 years some things that have happened, and before I get there, there'll probably be some more. But I'm going to the other side. And so we need to be patient in the difficulties that we're going to face. And then continuing instant in prayer, we need to be consistent in our prayers of reliant faith in our God. He is able. He can get us through. Uh, Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. All right, we need to be generous. We need to be compassionate. And we need to have an attitude that we're here to serve others, not ourselves. All right, now, that's, that's a description of the way we ought to be living. But now look at verse 11. I want to zero in on verse 11. What it tells us is not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I found that to be a great summary verse that kind of puts it all together for us to understand what's going on in the day in which we live with all this casualness. It tells us not to be slothful. It tells us that we should be fervent and that we should be serving. Not slothful. Uh, It says slothful in business. Now maybe this is the first thing that crosses your mind when you read that. I need to be a good good employee or a good employer. Not slothful in business. But you know what Jesus said? He said, I must be about my father's business. So we don't need to be slothful in the Lord's business. It's easy to be lazy. Doesn't take a lot of effort, does it? But it takes a lot of effort not to be lazy. There's a lot lot to be done. So, he says we are not to be slothful. Slothful is the idea of being idle or lazy or inactive or indulging in ease. It's the thought of taking the path of least resistance and always remaining in your comfort zone. Always. Slothful. Hmm. Jesus said he had to be busy about the Father's business. We should not be slothful about our Father's business. Amen. Later on in this, I've just got this written down in my notes, Uh, we'll deal with the secular versus spiritual a little bit later. Uh, A lot of people like to separate it. I want you to know God never does. I've got my secular things I have to do, then I have my spiritual things that I have to do. Show me where God says that. I can understand the secular when you're lost. But once you're saved, 
everything becomes spiritual at that point, or should be. Everything. So, in this spiritual matter, we cannot be slothful. The word fervent means to be hot, boiling with activity. To be filled with zeal, eagerness, earnestness, and enthusiasm. Well, fervent, obviously, is the opposite of slothful. So don't be this, but be this. Be fervent. Uh, service is defined probably differently than you realize. The word service is defined as being in bondage, as a slave. You say, well, I, well, I don't get that. You've been bought with a price. You belong to Christ. He paid for you. And now he has a work he wants you to do. You are bound to him. You are his servant. I mean, isn't that what servants do is serve? He's told us, don't be slothful, be fervent and serve. So we are, we are to be servants uh, for the Lord. And it means to carry out a task that it's your responsibility to complete. He has a work for you to do. You say, well, do you know what it is? I think I know what mine is. Do you know what yours is? You say, well, I really don't know. Well, ask God. He knows. He'd be glad to reveal it to you. He wants you to do it. He wants you to serve Him in the capacity that He wants you to serve Him in. And He's already told us that in these passages where it says the, the, the head of the house was going away and He left His servants with responsibilities to take care of until He returns. He's coming soon. But He wants us to, and we've already looked at this, occupy till He comes. He wants us to occupy our space, not just to fill up a pew but to occupy the work, the service that he has for us to do. Uh, the word service here can actually be defined as either voluntary or involuntary. So I, I guess I don't have to. Is that right? How about this? I believe this would be a better way of looking at it. I get to. I get to. I didn't have to come to church tonight. I get to. That's a big difference, you know. I've heard it said that maturity in children, that you want your children to grow up to where they don't feel like they have to do right. They want to get to the point where they want to do right. That's growing up. Isn't that a lot of the same way with Christianity? Oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. You're not going to last very long that way. I get to do this. This is my, the heart, my heart's desires. I want to do this. That's, that's the idea of the kind of service that God wants us to have. God does not force it upon you, but He expects it from you. Right? Service for God is to be voluntary, but it's your choice to make. If you don't choose that, you're going to be casual. If you don't choose that, you're going to be slothful. Because if you're fervent... This is going to be coming out of your mouth. Lord, what would you have me to do? Yeah, right. That's really not the approach of most in our day. It's just not. Right. You know. Amen. All right, I'll give you an illustration. This threefold idea of being not slothful, but being fervent and serving. You cannot live for God in neutral. I found some interesting things about that. Neutral is not a gear of activity. Neutral is a gear of slothfulness. Neutral has no responsibility of activity. You don't expect your car to do anything in neutral. And if that's where we are, if we're in neutral, we might have our engine running. But we're not going anywhere. 
We're just sitting there. Neutral is a casual gear. This one kind of plows a little deeper. Neutral is a spectator's gear. To sit back and just watch it happen. The only way neutral ever moves is by, by being pushed <clears throat> or rolling downhill. No progress. Rolling downhill. Waiting to crash in the valley, I guess. It's just, it has no, it has no progress to it. No forwardness to it. No fervency to it. I've noticed something about, it's a little different in Kentucky than I'm used to from this standpoint. Uh, most of the people up here don't have mufflers on their cars. <laughs> I mean, I, I, saw, I had, saw a car today that got behind me and then went around me, and it was one of these real high-dollar Mercedes Benz that sounded like an old 50 Chevy or something when it went by me because it, it just didn't seem like it had a muffler on it. It was just, you know, doing all that. Uh, by the way, mufflers sound, loud sound, is not power. Right. It's just right. noise. Just noise. Right. Yeah. So I can put my car in neutral and just rev that thing up and, and sound like I'm flying and I'm still sitting there. Right. Or I can, now I know you're not supposed to do this, but you can, you know, gut out one of those mufflers or something and all of a sudden I mean, it sounds like I'm getting ready for NASCAR. But I'm still just sitting there. Making a lot of noise, making no progress. Why? I mean, neutral. Neutral's a casual gear. Neutral is a spectator's gear. Uh, neutral does not serve God. It just doesn't. God doesn't intend for someone's ministry to be to push you to get you to do something, but sometimes that's what we're forced to do. God wants you to get at it. And do what he wants you to do. Uh, the problem is, there's just no fervent fire in neutral. Well, I'm at church. Great. Don't stay home. Uh, well, you know, I do a few things every once in a while. Great. Don't quit. But let me ask you, is it, are you really where God wants you to be? I'm not talking about in location. I'm talking about in gear, in activity. Is that, is that where we really are? Uh, he wants us to get in gear so we can do what He wants us to do by serving Him. Those that do not watch are in neutral when it comes to serving God. So, verse 11 is saying this to us. We are to get out of neutral, get in gear and get busy moving forward in the service for God. Not slothful, but fervent serving God. Amen. Get in gear. Yeah. Get in gear. Neutral is a gear of complacency that leads to losing battles with the devil. I'm going to prove it to you. If you think that I'm okay by just kind of you know, sitting back and laying back and no problem, I, you know, don't, 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 don't expect too much out of me, uh, you're going to find out that losing battles with the devil is going to become commonplace for you. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 26. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. All right, the Bible says in verse 36 of Matthew 26, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And we've already defined watch. And he went a little further. And fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them 
asleep. Remember? The antonym for watching was sleeping. He found them sleeping. And saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? That's a question. Now, the statement is, watch and pray. Because if you don't, you're going to start losing the battle with the devil. The next statement is, that ye enter not into temptation. We have to stay in gear. We have to stay watchful. We have to be circumspect. All those things that we looked at last week. If not, we're going to enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now that's a true statement. That's not an excuse. Right. It's a statement. Because right. yes, we do get weary. And we even get weary in well-doing sometimes. We get tired physically. Right. But that doesn't change what God's called us to do and called us to be. And he, it says in verse 42, And he went away again the second time and prayed and saying, O my Father, if this cup uh, may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Now that's just a statement of fact. It's not a statement of excuse. Right. Amen. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now. You missed the boat. You missed the opportunity that you needed to take advantage of to watch and pray when I was going through what I was going through. It's too late now. You see, while we're in neutral, the world passes by. While we're in neutral, our responsibilities are passing by. And they're being undone by us. Because of the casual approach that we have. Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The disciples showed an indifference to what is going on with Jesus. Not that important. Me getting my sleep was more important. I mean, I'm tired. What do you expect? Well, maybe God expects us to do what He wants us to do. Jesus even said, couldn't you just do it one hour? I'm not asking you never to go to sleep again. Couldn't you just do it one hour? We certainly can become weary in this life. But our responsibility must not be dictated to by the situations and circumstances, but by the commands of the Word of God and the necessity of personal service for God. You ever had some kind of a chore you had to do? You just need to do it. Have you done it yet? Or are you still thinking about it? I sure hope I get around to it sometime, you know. Somebody gave me a thing one time. It was a circle with a two and an it written on it. Round to it. You ought to get round to it, you know. Maybe I will one day. Maybe I will. And until you do, it'll sit there. It's not going to get done. But you know what? Uh, if you wait long enough, when you get around to it, it's too late. Yeah. Amen. That's what Jesus just told them. Go ahead and sleep now. It's too late. You could not do what I needed you to do when I was going through what I was going through. So we need to have our responsibility or take our responsibility of personal service. Jesus warns them that their fleshly sleep 
will bring on the distinct possibility of temptations that they will yield to. Scary thought. While they were sleeping, now, let's go back to Sunday, they were not preparing. I used to accuse some of the students that I had that I thought the, the approach that they took to test was to take the book, slide it under their pillow, lay their head on their pillow at night and go to sleep and hope through osmosis it would get in their head. I never heard one of them tell me that worked. I had one girl that she took one of my tests and she did really well, which most of the time she didn't. She did really well. And so I asked her, I said, what, what, what did you do? She said, Mr. Moore, I studied. And I looked at her, and I could do this with a straight face, by the way. What a novel concept. I thought that's what I've been telling you all year. She said, well, it worked. I said, yes, it must have. You've got a very good grade on it. The idea, though, is that we're, if we're asleep, not only are we not accomplishing anything, the Bible also tells us that what we're doing in our sleep is opening up the door to the enemy. Yeah. If you'll think about that idea of being in gear, it's kind of hard for the devil to catch up to you if you're in gear. Right. No problem at all when you're in neutral. Right. He's right there. He didn't even have to run you down. Right. So the idea is not to be casual. If we're casual, in that neutral gear, the devil ends up being the one pushing us. The devil's not brave, but he is arrogant. And he has no rules of engagement. The devil can do anything he wants to that God allows him. Somebody made the statement about the devil not playing fair. Well, first of all, the devil doesn't play at all. But he, he, has, no, he has no scruples. He doesn't have to be uh, uh, accustomed to certain accords that you have to go by except for the restrictions that God puts on him. You remember the situation with Job. God put up a boundary. He said, this is as far as you can go. And what did the devil do? He went as far as he could go. And because of that, it was rough on Job. Sure. Amen. It was tough. We're easily overcome when we're asleep. We're not aware of the dangers when we're asleep. Amen. Maybe you're not one of these people, but I am. Once I've laid my head down and I've gone to sleep, I'll probably take a bomb wake me up. I mean, it'd have to be one of those, you know, claps of thunder that makes the whole building shake. I've heard a few of those since I've been here. But I'm going to sleep when I'm sleeping. But that's the time to sleep. When the Bible tells us there's a time, that's not the time when God wants you to stay awake and to do what God wants you to do. We're not, uh, we're not alert enough to avoid pitfalls when we're being casual. We're going to stumble over everything. If we just go through the motions, then we'll find ourselves stuck in neutral and we'll be an easy target for the devil's attacks. And we've seen people left by the wayside. Casualties, so to speak. Uh, could I tell you why they're casualties a lot of the times? Because of their casual. The approach that they took. No diligence there. They just thought, I could just, you know, I could just kind of fly through this, no problem. All right, now, uh, one more thing. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I didn't say anything about a bag lunch tonight, so I'll try to be quicker. Matthew chapter 24 and verse uh, 43. The Bible says, But know this, 
that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, well, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. All right, if I knew when the thief was going to try to break in my house, I'd be awake and be waiting for him. Right. Sure. Well, but when was the last time the robber sent you a, a text message? I'm coming tonight at 1130. Be up and waiting for me now. No. No, he's going to wait and make sure that he gets the least resistance. Right. When you're asleep. When you're not alert. When you're not ready. That's when he's going to come. He said he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant... Which one? The slothful one? No, the fervent one. The one who's serving. The one who's at his post. And we'll look at what that means in just a moment. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Think of it this way. You're in the military and you've been given a command to stand a certain post and you're supposed to be there and if by the chance your sergeant comes by, your commander comes by, the captain comes by, the general comes by, he's expecting to see you there and if he comes by and you're not, not good. See, not only... See, here, here's the problem with casualness. Not only does it affect you, it affects your family and it affects your church family. If you're casual, because you're not at your post. Right. You're not doing your part. Right. Right. Now, if you have a, a, some people that are real, you know, diligent and at it, and you don't do your part, they'll try to pick it up. They'll try to double up, and, and, and you know, because it has to be done. Right. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. Right. Amen. Can I be just honest with you? We've got enough to do just doing what God expects us to do. Right. Amen. Why does someone who is so on fire and diligent, why does he have to do your part? Sure. Because you're not doing your part. Right. Somebody has to. Right. Amen. But the idea here is to keep... He wants, us to, he wants to find us doing what we should be doing. We have a responsibility that has been committed to our keeping. Now, listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Keep it, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Hold fast, we heard this word this week, hold fast the form of sound words. Hold them, hold fast. Yeah. Hold fast. Uh, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. All right, now, keep is defined as to watch, to be on guard, to preserve, to obey, to observe, and to save intact we're not supposed to be going backwards we're supposed to be going forward remember the talents how did you profit in what I gave you you never profit in casualness never you never profit in neutral you never profit if you don't re realize the responsibility that we have to keep to guard and it's interesting, that word hold fast. Right? In the context of this, this passage, it means to grasp tightly a precious possession so that it can never be taken away from you. Amen. Hold fast, sound words. Yeah. King James Bible. Yeah. 
Hold it fast. Because they're trying to take it away from you. All right. This is not just trying to, you know, posture or something to try to make you think something special. I've held grandchildren in my arms. I've held my wife in my arms. I've never held anything more precious than this in my arms. The Word of God that we are to hold fast. It ought to be precious to us. The thought is since we do not know when the enemy is going to attack and we don't know when the Lord's coming either, we should always be watchful. Always. We should be watching for the enemy. Oh, he's after you. We should be watching for the Lord's return. I mean, wouldn't you want to be fervent serving the Lord when he comes? I would think so. To watch is to be ready. To watch is to be expectant. Uh, This is just, just something I do. If I know that someone's coming to my house, and they said they were going to come at such and such a time. Most of the time, probably at least 15 minutes before they come, you will find me walking through the house, going up to the window, open up the blinds, and see if they're there yet. I've done it all my life. Because I'm expecting company. I'm expecting them to be there. And if they come early, now I get disappointed when they come late. Because I, I, I was expecting them to come. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for them. There's nothing neutral about that. Right. Nothing casual about it. Oh, they'll get here when they get here. No. That can't be our approach either. Right. We need to have this expectancy that, right. that God, the Lord's coming. And, and we want to be what we should be right. when he comes. Yeah. I mean, the thief is after you to break in. He would have, it would have been avoided if you'd been awake. Right, right, right. But because you were asleep, he came in, and what did he do while you were asleep? He took some stuff from you. You don't believe that? You're not looking around. The church has lost things along the way. Because in the casual approach to being asleep, the Lord came in, I mean, the devil came in, took that, and yeah. took that, and yeah. took that. Yeah. Now, I, I promise you we can get it back. Yeah. God knows exactly where it is. Yeah. Yeah. But why did we lose it to begin with? Casualness. Yeah. Amen. Casualness. The Bible says we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. The glorious appearing, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking means to watch with an expectant patience. We're looking for His appearing. We ought to be going to the blinds. Oh, this could be today. I want to see Him today. If this is the time. But if today's not the day, My expectancy is not going to be just standing at the blinds. You see, what we did at the house, when we knew somebody was coming, we were preparing for them. You know, there's two ways to prepare for somebody coming to your house. You can go through the house and just clean up everything. Or when they get there, cut the lights off. I mean, the the cobwebs will still be there, but they can't see them. But you know what that person will probably do? You know, you really ought to have the lights on. So we ought to prepare. You see, cutting the lights off is the act of the slothful, the lazy. But the one who truly expects makes preparations for what they're expecting. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says this, Behold what manner of love... 
the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I believe that carries responsibility. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we're going to be like him. We shall be like him. That's the rapture, by the way. For we shall see him as he is. Now listen to verse 3 of 1 John chapter 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. You get in gear. You, you want to be asleep when the Lord comes spiritually? No, you want to be in gear. You want to be fervent. Amen. Watching as God has commanded us to do keeps us sharp, by the way. Yeah, sure. I think back over my childhood. My dad got, went off somewhere and told me he was coming back at a certain time. That kept me pretty sharp. Yeah. It was not good if he came back and I had not done what he told me to do. We had kind of a running joke when I used to work. We used to work together. He ran a car lot for years and years and years and years. He would go off to a car auction, and he said, I'm going to be back about 1 o'clock. He gave me this list of stuff to do about this long. And he said, by the way, after you eat lunch, I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this. I mean, he gave me this list that you couldn't do in three days, you know. But he was expecting me to do something while he was gone not just sit there and wait for him to come back. Right. So you can't operate that way. Right. You can't accomplish anything that, like that. You can't make any progress that way. Right. Watching keeps us sharp. It keeps us focused. It keeps us spiritually minded. Because our minds are stayed on the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Jesus is coming soon. Will he find you and me watching? Uh, have we lost our grip on our God-given responsibilities? Are we holding fast? Has the thief come in and stolen some of our influence while we were lulled to sleep? Jesus has already admonished us. We need to be on watch. We need to be on high alert. The devil twists the Bible, but he does know it. And since he knows it, he does know his time short. So what's he doing? I promise you he's not going into neutral. He's going into overdrive. And as a result of that, we need to be on high alert. We cannot be casual. We'll look at some more examples as, as we go through this study. But uh, I'm just amazed what I've seen God do through somebody that would let Him. Would we just let Him? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But John 15, 5 says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you're in neutral. You're just going through the motions of Christianity. But if you'll let me, through you, I can do marvelous things. Amazing things that literally the world just sits back and just has to say, wow. Wow. Lord, help us tonight to realize the gear that maybe we're in, to realize the gear we should be in, and to realize the gear that we need to stay in. Lord, help us to not be casual, slothful, but fervent. Knowing that we get to serve you. That we get to serve you. 
And Lord, just move in our midst with a stirring that just sets us on fire. The enemy is raging. But we know that you're greater. May we yield ourselves to you. When we submit to you, we can resist the devil. When we're in gear for you, we can make progress for the cause of Christ. Help us to do what you've called us to do. And we'll thank you. Lord, thank you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Pastor. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.